this song which I'm about to sing is called Atsavu. In English it's a, a legacy. Written and composed by a Jewish prisoner and on his way to Birkenau from Auschwitz to the guest chamber he took this art from his pockets and threw it out. And other prisoners picked it up and I had the opportunity to learn it. It's a message that we all should know and carry on. And it goes like follow. I der ich gesich mit die Welt abscheiden. I der ich geh zu mein Eibirchero. Before departing from this world, before I go to my eternal rest, with you, my child, I would like to speak. Come closer and listen carefully. You have been taught many noble ideas and do good deeds. This teaching you will certainly observe. It is only left. This last hour, come closer, child, and listen. A Jew, my child, where you born, remain Jewish, well and fine. The Jewish name have been for thousands of years and not to be ashamed of. Even when a attained the highest status, do not be ashamed of your Jewish identity. So others do humiliate us, believe me, they are vicious and arrogant. To be Jewish is our honor. The Jewish name cost us dearly. They cost us untold pain and suffering, and therefore are we cremated alive. Have pity on the vicious and arrogant, we must teach them and civilize them, assist the needy according to your ability, assist them wholeheartedly. Never ask them what belief they have. Even poor gypsies help them, help them also in need. He is a mensch, a brother. Give him bread and give him water and give him shelter. I have told you before and I'm t telling you again. Be a mensch and understand that all men are brothers. One God in heaven do we all have. Please remember, my child, that under all circumstances you shall remain a mensch and remain a Jew. Starting with the invasion of Poland in 1940, Germany embarked on a mass extermination project that would result in the elimination of more than six million European Jews. It was decided to cram as many men, women and children into cattle or railroad boxcars. Typically as many as 150 people were forced to stand inside these coffin-like vehicles for days without food, water, or ventilation. Many died before arriving at their final destinations. Several years ago, the Holocaust Memorial Center embarked on a project to acquire and restore one of these boxcars. In 2011, the center received delivery of an over 100-year-old German-built boxcar to be included in its permanent display. During 2012, construction of the Henrietta and Alvin Weisberg Gallery was begun. Once finished, the boxcar will be the main focal point of this new exhibit. It will help explain what millions experienced on their way to their final days of life. On September 24th, in front of hundreds of supporters and a handful of Holocaust survivors, the boxcar was moved from its temporary location to its new permanent home.
Yes, I'm one of the uh, ch child survivor of the Holocaust. And believe me that this boxcar reminds me of lots of things. And uh, the first time I went in one of those was with my mother. We were on our way to a labor camp. And uh, oh, we were probably maybe a hundred of, of us in there. It was just packed like sardines. But on top of that, what the German did, it was good enough to actually suffer that much. They put some saltpeter. Saltpeter is a phosphate that they use to make uh, gunpowder and uh, other fertilizer, things like that. And when saltpeter is in contact with liquid, it emanates some fumes. It makes you sick. It makes your eyes water. It makes you vomit. So you can imagine uh, the, with kids and older people, what happened is that when the, we urinate, of course, you have to go, you have to go. So then they, they made people sick. And when we arrived in Drancy, they actually dragged, probably, I didn't count, I was too small, I was about nine and a half years old. Uh, they probably dragged maybe 10 or 15 bodies that, that couldn't take it anymore, died. It was awful, awful. So uh, uh, <laughs> that box car, <laughs> yeah. We were packed in into the box, box car. How long were you in the boxcar? Uh, for two days. How many people on the boxcar? Approximately between 120 to 150. <laughs> where did the boxcar end up? Where did it stop? In Birkenau. Did you travel in the boxcar with any family? With my mother sister and the uncle. Did any of them survive the Holocaust? Just my uncle. When you see the boxcar, what does it mean to you? Well, it's not present memories. You come to, we're going to come to visit the boxcar when it's inside the museum. No. How is it going to make you feel? It's a permanent home, a permanent memory. Very sad. It's per permanent. Ab absolutely. Myself a partner there who wore a Gestapo uniform. His name was Ludwig Cronenberg, and we were crawling in under the barbed wire into the ghetto, which took us a good night, the whole night to get there. And we were able to um, get out a few uh, people out of the ghetto in Lodge and bring them to Warsaw. But after a very short time, one of our members proved to be a traitor. He was a Gestapo informant, and we were all arrested. We were all arrested, and uh, Ludwig Cronenberg, my partner, was executed. And my paper somehow held up to the scrutiny, and I was sentenced to nine months imprisonment for sympathizing with Jews as a German. They still didn't discover I was Jewish. I was sentenced to nine months in prison for sympathizing with Jews. I, I spent the time, the first three months I was in panic because I didn't know exactly what they wanted with me. They came to my apartment, to my room, to arrest me 
I thought that they knew I was Jewish. Yet they, when they brought me to prison, they put me in the German cell. And I, I just didn't know exactly what to think about it. But once my, came, my case came up in court, I found out that I was arrested for sympathizing with Jews. They sent me then to another prison, and after nine months, they let me go. Because I was a German, I completed my sentence, out I went. When I came out, I discovered that my parents didn't want to go into the ghetto, so they left Lodz when the ghetto was established, and they went to the city called Tomasz of Mazowiecki, where my grandfather was the cantor of the city, where my two aunts were teachers. We had friends, we had relatives. Uh, this was our town. So this is where I went to join my parents. I was swollen up starvation, I had a, a skin problem after the prison, it was a horror. And um, my parents put, got me back on my feet and they thought that they escaped the ghetto, but it didn't take very long before the ghetto in Tomaszów was also made a ghetto. In every city in Poland they made ghettos. And the small villages and towns around are surrounding the towns had to move in, the Jewish population had to move in. We had to absorb them and uh, it became a very, uh, very sad situation. First of all, um, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in, in this uh, tight uh, contained uh, uh, epidemics, and, and everything spread, and we had to work for the Germans in, in workshops, but we were not paid for our work, we were given food rations. Food rations that were not sufficient. In order to survive, we had to sell our possessions, and in order to do that, we had to go under the barbed wire to the outside, to the uh, local population for uh, some potatoes or some bread. And, uh, Epidemics spread and starvation spread and people were dying like flies. And we had no luxury of funerals. When somebody died, the dead body was put out on the sidewalk. Young men with uh, boxes were pulling them on wheels and they were picking up the dead bodies for mass, mass burial and the cemetery. Now, uh, we... Uh, wanted the ghetto to function because our parents survived World War I and they said that war is hell but it ends and when it ends you go back home so this is what we were hoping the war will end and we'll go back home to our life as we knew it so in order to survive the ghetto we needed to function schools were forbidden for Jewish children so we had illegal schools in it. I had a school in my house, school, you know, a few children. And, and uh, my cousin, some other girls, mostly girls did that because uh, somehow girls took over. Girls were stronger than, than men. Also, uh, girls could pass easier. Boys, Jewish boys, were the only people that were circumcised in Europe. So if the Germans wanted to check on a Jewish man, all they had to do was to check if he was circumcised. I would be girls, with girls he could pass. So in any case, um, that's what we had, illegal schools. Then we had a little hospital. We had no medication, but there were doctors and nurses that were trying to help people. We even made a Jewish theater to give people some more morale to, to survive. And um, in the schooling, by the way, the parents even wanted uh, to have Hebrew school teachers. We had one Hebrew school teacher who went from one school to the other, was giving the children uh, uh, you know, just Hebrew education as much as she could. We had no books, we had nothing. We had to do, improvise everything. Then there was this young group which, to which my little brother belonged. Those were boys and girls. The group was called Akiba. Akiba was a Zionist group. They were the runners for the underground in Krakow. And then uh, the big ghettos, like ours was a little ghetto, we were just 15,000 people. But, uh, but the big ghettos like Warsaw and Lodz, 
there the Germans were emptying the ghetto by sending people to the east. They used to say that they're taking people to work in the east. So, uh, this wasn't, you know, nobody minded to go to work. The only thing they started worrying was that nobody came back from the east, that they didn't get letters from there. What's happening there? They needed to know where they're going. So now those young runners, like my brother and his friends, were put on trains and sent by regular trains, followed the other trains to check where they were going. And they discovered Treblinka, Sobibur, Helno, and other dead camps. And when they came back to the ghetto and told us that the Germans are making concentration camps where people are being gassed and burned, we didn't want to believe them. The Germans? The most cultured nation in the world? They're killing people by gassing and burning their bodies? <laughs> We even had a man in our ghetto in Tomashov. We had a man who told us that he escaped from, from a, a place called Treblinka. And he told us all about Treblinka. And we called him the crazy man from Treblinka because we didn't want to believe him either. Till one day, this was November now of nine, oh yes. Uh, during the time um, I, I uh, got older, and by the time I was 19, I met uh, a young man, and uh, we fell in love, and we decided we're going to get married. We're going to get married, and uh, this way we'll stick together, and nobody can take us apart. We, we have family. And we did. We got married in November of 1942. Something happened, we were in my in-law's house and a shooting started around the ghetto. And when we heard the shooting, we knew that we had to be in our room because whenever there was a, a, anything happening, you had to be in your place, raids or anything. And we ran through the streets of this ghetto and the bullets were falling and people were lying on, on the street dead. And I couldn't move, you know, like a dream sometimes you, you run and you cannot move. This is how I, he was practically pulling me. This was on a Friday night. Saturday morning, they decree, decreed that the ghetto will be divided in half. As you heard, it was only 15,000 people. And the first part of the ghetto, let's see, the southern part of the ghetto, is to come to the marketplace, which was the se selection area. Uh, and uh, to go through a selection. And anybody who couldn't come, who was too sick, too feeble, too old, too young, was to be put on a chair in front of the building. Nothing alive was to be left in the building. Even some people maybe still had a cat or a dog, even those animals, they were Jewish dogs and Jewish cats. An assessment was dispatched and he shot on the spot, everybody who sat on those chairs, everything was killed on the spot. They started on Saturday with one part of the ghetto, rested on Sunday, and Monday they took the second part of the ghetto. On Saturday I lost my parents and my older brother, and Monday I lost my in-laws, including my little Ruthie who was my student in my school. There are uh, 750 of us were left, of my family only my little brother, myself, my husband and his younger brother, we were the four left. At this point my younger brother said to me, I don't believe that they have any intention of letting anybody live. I don't want to be killed here. I'm going to try to find the partisans in the forest and I'm going to fight for my life. And he escaped and never to be heard from again. I just hope that he ha got his wish because uh, there were different groups of partisans, not all of them were friendly to the Jews. And finally, those small camps became obsolete and they put us on trains and they sent us to Auschwitz. 
And on arrival at Auschwitz, we knew already about concentration camps. We didn't even doubt it anymore. But still, to arrive at Auschwitz and to see it was such a horror, I cannot even believe that, that it really existed. And uh, we had to jump up. First of all, uh, those creatures in striped uniforms uh, came up on the train and they made a jump off the train. And on the platforms, we were immediately separated, men separate, women separate, anybody under 12 and over 40, straight to the gas chambers. We were marched up to the camp proper. In our case, we were taken to Birkenau. Now, Auschwitz was very, very big. Auschwitz one, Auschwitz this, and Birkenau was the place where they had the crematoria and the gas chambers. And when we were marching to the to um, Birkenau, and I saw the chimneys, and this dispute, just flames and flames and ashes were flying, and you could feel them on your fingers. Those were human ashes, and I said to myself, I have to survive. I'm strong. I need to survive. The world has to find out about it. This cannot be forgotten. And this, this was working on my adrenaline. This is why I did survive. I went through so much later, but I did not give in. So we arrived. The first stop was a building about a room of this size where we were stripped and we had to go to the next room where they shaved us. The next room was a, a disinfecting bath. And then they took us uh, to a third room where they threw at us clothing. We got just dresses and shoes. We did not get underwear. We did not get uh, uh, any uh, stockings or, or socks, nothing, just like that. When we came out of this building, it was evening, it was night. We didn't recognize each other without the hair and in those terrible rags that we were wearing. People were crying and milling around and just crying, not recognizing each other. And the SS women were beating us with whips to form a marching column of five abreast. And we came back and I was watching, I was looking, I was memorizing. We came to the uh, camp proper and I discovered that it was divided into sub-camps. Camp A was the men, Camp B of Beitzwai Bay, or the Czech camp, was the women and this is where they put us. When we arrived, there was no room for us in Auschwitz. So they took the girls from the Czech camp and gassed them. So there was room for us. We got in the Czech camp. The only people from those Czech, this Czech group that were left were the women that were in charge of the barracks and their helpers. The rest of the population was gone. Each camp, then there was camp uh, C, also women. Camp D was men. Then there was the gypsy camp. The gypsy camp, where when the gypsies arrived at Auschwitz, they were not uh, subject to selection. They took them all, mothers, fathers, children, and everybody into this gypsy camp. But later, in November of 1944, when the Hungarian uh, uh, influx came to Auschwitz, they needed room for them. So they gassed all the gypsies, all the gypsies, in one night. Elie Wiesel was one of them that was in the former gypsy camp. And then there was the twin camp, where Dr. Mengele kept twins for his experiments. He made horrible experiment of those twins. Most of the twins, if they survived, one survived, they, the other didn't. Most of them. And uh, then there was FKL, or Frauen Konzentrationslager, which was the beginning of the uh, uh, camp in Birkenau. This is A and B. Each camp was surrounded by a double electric barbed wire. At the entrance was a hut for the guard. When you came in, the camp was divided by a Lagerstrasse or Camp Street. On both sides were barracks. Whenever you see pictures of our it looks so geometrically perfect. That's how it was. In, there were 15 barracks on this side, 15 on this. A thousand people in each barrack. We had to sleep on shelves, eight abreast. We could not turn singularly because there was not enough room. We had to turn and come in. On the second day after our arrival, 
they registered us. We had to stand by tables according to the letter of the alphabet, and there they had ledgers, big ledgers, and in those ledgers they put now down our name and a number. And the number was then tattooed on our forearms on the spot. This was our, our, our things. Now, Auschwitz was also not only Jewish, uh, there were Christian uh, people in Auschwitz. The Christians, of course, uh, I don't know if gypsies uh, were Christian or not, but there were Jehovah's Witnesses. They were political prisoners. They were uh, criminals. All of us were marked by triangles. And we, our number was not only tattooed on our skin, but also sewn on a piece of rag and our clothing. And under that number was a triangle. The Jewish prisoner, we had a yellow triangle. Political prisoners had a red triangle. There were also German political prisoners, mind you. Uh, criminals had black triangles, antisocials green triangles, Jehovah's Witnesses purple triangles, homosexuals pink triangles. That's how we were marked. The only difference between them and us, they also were tattooed, they also had a, um, a, um, a, they were punished if somebody in a group, collective punishment in the, the groups, if somebody committed something against their rules, the whole group was punished. And um, the only thing, they were sentenced to Auschwitz, and that sentence was up, they were let go. We were brought to Auschwitz to die. We were not brought for uh, any limit, limited time. But in, uh, at the end of 1944, when the Germans were losing the war, which we didn't know, we had no uh, uh, information whatsoever what was happening on the outside. Plus, we didn't think anymore in those terms. Um, they came uh, from the German industry to look for still able-bodied people. And they came and we stood erect and we pinched our cheeks to look healthy. And I was very lucky to be chosen to work in a factory called Telefunken in uh, Germany. Now Telefunken, my parents used to have a Telefunken radio. They used to manufacture radios before the war and they still do now. But during the war, we manufactured airplane parts. And as a matter of fact, they was, the Germans were so, uh, uh, you know, uh, well uh, organized that we went through um, aptitude tests when we arrived at the factories. The only problem was, this was now winter, this was in November of 1944, our shoes, uh, most of us, uh, we didn't have shoes, our shoes fell apart because we could not remove them for the night. They were always wet. If we would remove the shoes when we went to sleep in our shoes, they would have disintegrated. And uh, they did the disintegrate, but they would, uh, our feet would swell up so that we couldn't put them on in the morning. So that's why we uh, just slept in wet shoes. And at the end, when we were living, leaving Auschwitz, we were given wooden shoes or wooden soles that were really strapped to our ankles with strings. And uh, we were given sh uh, coats, overcoats. But those overcoats, I never heard anybody remember that, but I do. They cut the sleeves off and mixed them up and sewed them on so we couldn't escape. We were this way, we were too visible. Also on the backs, of our coat, they painted a red cross, like red. We came, when we came to Reichenbach, by the way, which was on the Czech border, in that camp, they painted our backs with a white paint, this way, a regular cross. So there, there was no way of escaping. We had to walk kilometers, six kilometers to the uh, factory, in the snow, this, the winter was absolutely a horror, that winter of 1944-45, very, very bad winter. And the shoes, the, the wood, the snow would gather under the wood, so we had to stop and kick off the snow to, to be able to continue walking. We were weak to begin with. I was so sick. I had malaria, dysentery. I was so very sick that if not the fact that I had the willpower to live, I wouldn't have. 
In January 1945, a group of men from Auschwitz arrived in our camp. They were the men at the death march that the, the Germans took out of Auschwitz because the Russians were coming close. They didn't want to leave any witnesses, and I think that they also wanted to protect themselves because if they wouldn't have anything to do, they would have been sent to the Russian front. This way they were working. The, still during when the Germans were losing the war, the priority was still killing of the Jews, not the war effort. Killing of the Jews was the priority. Trains were still taken to, to, to take people from, from all countries. We had people in Africa, from Greece, from Italy, from all over the world. They were still brought in where they needed trains for the German army. They be were the priority. And this group of men from this death march arrived in our camp in Reichenbach. And one of those men knew me. And he told me that both my husband and his brother were killed on this death march. They perished. In February, our camp was uh, 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 liquidated, and we were put on, first on a march. We marched for three days over the mountains. They gave us each a loaf of bread at the outset. This was supposed to last for three days. We were so hungry, we just devoured it on the spot. For three days we had absolutely nothing to eat. After three days of marching, we were put on a train, cattle train. This time we were going to another factory telephone, the same company in Westphal, in Porta Westphalica. You saw before a man came over to say hello to me. He was in the Porta Westphalica as a Christian, as a Polish uh, forced laborer, and he saw us being put on the trains there. He saw it when, when he heard my story. He said, I saw you girls. But of course he couldn't say anything because he had false papers. He was, he, he was saving himself. It was also a story, you know. So in any case, um, we came there and the factory was seven stories into the mountains deep with the elevator down with all machinery and this is when i really started losing faith i said how will the allies know where to bomb the factory when it's deep in the mountains covered with snow and and and, and uh, vegetation how can they ever find us and uh, this we stayed there till march March of 1945, it was Passover, I remember still, and uh, they put us again on the cattle trains. And now the cattle trains, those were the box cars. They put us, they stopped till there was no more room. Once there was no more room, they beat the last ones with whips, so they got a little more room. They stopped more. As a result, we could not sit down. We could not meet, move. When there was no more room, we had to stand. And, and, and uh, some people just died standing up. And after four days, they stopped the trains. We had to jump off. They removed the dead bodies. On the way back in the train, onto the train, they gave us, like this, in our hand, a handful of raw elbow macaroni. They had no place to cook anymore. This was the first food after four days. Then we traveled again a few days and, and we got a couple of raw potatoes. Then they put us in a, in a field in uh, Ludwigslust. Then they took us to a camp temporarily where they had salt mines and uh, people who had to work in the salt mines. But I was uh, so sick that I was just in the barracks and on my uh, bed. And then finally, as you realize, I have to condense six years of, of, of my story. So I skip a lot and I just go through the basics. Finally, we arrived in Hamburg, Altona. You heard about Hamburg before. Hamburg is a very big industrial city in Germany. And Altona is a suburb of Hamburg. And they made a makeshift camp for us. And on an arrival, I was chosen to work in the kitchen. And again, my attitude, my, my, you know, I was always visible. 
and they took me there and I was working in the kitchen which was like winning the lottery only I could hardly eat I could not but I was able to steal some food from the kitchen from my barracks from my friends and uh, when we worked 12 hour shifts and my co-worker was a Yugoslav partisan girl and it's what I remember, it seems like such a um, mundane thing, but I remember she had hair. She looked like a girl. We didn't, we came from Auschwitz, our hair was starting to grow, but we didn't have hair, we didn't look like girls. Plus, she was not Jewish, so she, she wasn't treated the same way. Uh, one night, the camp commander came into the kitchen, and he said to us, um, there is a um, transport coming in. Transport in our lingo meant people and cattle trains. There's a transport coming in. They didn't eat for days. If you want them to have soup, you have to stay on and cook. And of course, we wouldn't refuse. So we stayed on, my Yugoslav friend and myself. And in came an SS woman. You know, the ones that I told you how horrible they were. She took out the pack of cigarettes and wanted to give us cigarettes. She had a smile on her face and she said, you know, girls, whatever happened to you wasn't our fault. We didn't want you any harm. We just had to obey orders. And so sweet and so nice. And I looked at my Yugoslav friend and she looked at me. What is she talking about? We understood the words, but we didn't know what she means by that. But one thing I got out of it, I got that she was approachable. And the thing that worried us the most was if they go to let us, we knew something was happening, but if they are going to let us stay in this camp, or if they are going to put us again on the trains, which was just murder. So that's what I asked her. I said, are we going to stay here or are we going on transports again? So she said, oh no, 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 no more transports, no, she said. And then she added, except the Jews. Boom. Then again, they didn't think I was Jewish. And the next morning is roll call. Roll call, Jews on the left, non-Jews on the right. I had to stand roll call in the kitchen because that's where I worked. So I went on the left and my Yugoslav girl was on the right and she said to me, are you crazy? Come with me. They don't know that you are Jewish. Stay with me. And I said to her, you know something, a couple of weeks ago I may, might have taken you up on it. I cannot anymore. I'm finished. I'm going with my friends. Whatever will be, will be. And this saved my life, I later found out, but I didn't realize that at the moment. And we tra were traveling for a couple of days, and the trains were bombed, and, and, and uh, the SS was jumping off the train and pointing their machine guns toward the train. Should we try to disperse, they would shoot us. That's how we were traveling, and after a couple of days, we finally wound up in Denmark. The name of the city was Padborg, Denmark. When we got there, the two SS men, they were always escorting those trains, put their knapsack on, and they said to me, now you are going to be free. What's going to happen to us, God only knows. And off they went. And there were Danish people who came to the train to pick up their relatives. And those were ladies and gentlemen in civilian clothing with coats and gloves and hugging them and, and, and kissing them and taking them home. And I sat on the floor and I looked at that and this is when it first hit me. Why did you even bother? You have no place to go, there's nobody waiting for you. This is when it first hit me that I had nobody and nothing. And I became paralyzed at this moment. From my waist down I could not move. Beautiful, tall angels, I call them, approached the train. They put steps. <coughs> when they discovered that I couldn't move, they wanted to take a stretcher for me. But my friends wouldn't let me go because they, they knew where people on stretchers went. So my friends helped me down and supported me. I was standing on the platform and this 
this was the Swedish Red Cross, ladies from the Swedish Red Cross. Um, Himmler made a deal with the Swedish Count Volker Bernadotte. They started with picking up uh, uh, Scandinavian prisoners uh, from the camps and then wound up, made a deal that some of the Jewish prisoners would be given passage to Sweden. And we came to Denmark. We stayed a couple of days in Denmark. Then they put us up. If you ever were in Scandinavia, then you know that there's a ferry boat between Copenhagen and Malmö. And um, they took us on those ferry boats and brought us over to uh, Sweden. And in Sweden they put us on Pullman trains, regular trains. And it was the 5th of May of 1945. It was a nice day, the sun was shining. I sat on the bench on this train. The window was open and a man peeked in and said, Shalom. And we jumped. Shalom? Are you Jewish? Are there Jews alive? Are there Jews walking on the street? He says, oh, well, I'm the, the rabbi uh, in this city. This <clears throat> The rabbi who later married me. And we were absolutely beside ourselves and there was a group of Polish Christian girls in the corner of the wagon. And one of them got up and came running to us. I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish, I just had false papers. So when she heard the word Shalom, she just absolutely uh, uh, couldn't contain herself. Well, in any case, that's how we arrived in Sweden. Uh, I was uh, put, we were in school buildings. The doctors told me that there is no medication for me. I was very fortunate that I was so sick because I couldn't eat. And this was saved my life. Very many of my friends were dying of eating in the beginning of our liberation in Sweden. They were just dying. The, 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 the Red Cross didn't, didn't understand the extent of our malnutrition. They didn't know. Once I got better, once I was able to stand up, they put me on a scale and I weighed 80 pounds. And this was after I already gained some weight because I started gaining by... And I made myself another promise. Either I'm going to function and able, be able to take care of myself or I'm just going to end it all. I just didn't see any reason for me living. I had family in America, I knew that, but America was so abstract and so far away. At this time you didn't travel between Europe and America that much. So I started by standing by my bed and started moving. We were in school buildings, so my bed was by the wall. The other wall was a window. I was moving my legs with my hands, one leg at a time, till I got to the window. By the window I rested, then I was going back to my bed. I looked out. One day when I stood by the window, I saw this big Swedish man on a bicycle. He came to the school building, looked up, pointed to me and said, come on down, come on down. And my heart stopped, oh my God, he has news for me. And I ran down two flights of stairs without realizing it. When I came down, the man gave a box, a package to uh, the soldier, because there were Swedish soldiers around the school building, because we, we had so many illnesses with us that we could not communicate with the population. And he gave him the package, waved goodbye to me and left, and the soldier gave me the package. I went mesmerized back up two flights of stairs to my bedroom, sat down on my bed and opened the package. Those were chocolates. It was just a nice man who saw them. Uh -huh. I cried like a baby. I gave away every bit of this chocolate. I didn't want it. I didn't realize at the time the big gift he gave me, I could walk. I, I, I just didn't want to have children, but after the miscarriage, I, I got, you know, Mother Nature take over. I wanted a baby so badly, and my son was born, he was the prettiest baby in the world, 
and then 15 months later my daughter also. And those two children gave me a reason for being. The only thing, I never spoke about the Holocaust. The reason for me surviving was to speak about the Holocaust. Not the Holocaust, we didn't know the word Holocaust at the time. This was the final solution of the German que Jewish question, that's what it was. But I, so I, what I um, couldn't talk, I didn't want to speak to my children because I was afraid that my children will learn to hate the people who did it to me. I don't want my children to grow up to be hateful. I want my children to be normal children. And not to tell them the whole story, I couldn't tell them anything. It took very long time till my children heard anything and never directly. The only time my children ever heard parts of my story, they never heard the whole story, is when they hear me speak to others. I cannot speak to my children about it. And when we started speaking, it was first really for real. I, I spoke before that in, in New Jersey. I was invited to speak in a Hebrew school where the parents were very much against it and uh, they didn't want their children to be disturbed by such tragic things. So, um, but uh, the principal was a wonderful lady and she, she said, you just come and you just speak. The children had to have spe special permission from, from their parents. And when I came home after that, I was sick for two days. I was scared to stay in bed for two days. It's just too much, you know, too, too hard. And still, when I speak to children, there are certain things you heard that the children never do because I, I cannot do that to them. Um, but um, first, when the deniers came and started speaking that the Holocaust never happened, oh, this is when we decided that this is, has to be taken care of. How can they tell us? And also, you know, in spite of everything, I'm a, a, a real optimist. I hope that there are more good in people than there is bad. And that I think that if I reach some young people and teach them, that of course we are different, but we learn from one another's differences. The difference is wonderful. We cannot judge somebody because prejudice is prejudging. We cannot judge somebody because they are different from us. We are not better, neither are they. We have to learn to respect one another. You want to be respected, you have to give respect back. And this is so very important for me. When I speak to young people and I see in their eyes that they got it, that they get what I'm, what I'm here to do. Because somebody said to me, do you want them to hate the Germans? I said, this is not my goal. I don't hate them. I, I know that there were Germans who were decent. So um, I gave you a little... This is a five minute warning. We're gonna break at seven so that we have some time to visit the Mani Nadeau Learning Center and you have some time to move into the other room. Do, so, do we have any questions?